In the depths of Black Canyon, where Nevada meets Arizona, stands a wall of concrete so massive it could build a highway from New York to San Francisco, a structure that forever altered the course of an untamed river and the fate of an entire region. For centuries, the Colorado River carved its way through the desert with destructive indifference, flooding farms in spring, abandoning them to drought by summer, until desperate men decided to challenge nature itself. They came in 1931, thousands of men from from every corner of the nation during economic collapse. Some had been bankers, others farmers, all now willing to dangle from ropes hundreds of feet above the canyon floor, jackhammers in hand, for 50 cents an hour. What followed was a feat of engineering without precedent, executed in temperatures reaching 120 degrees in a desolate wasteland with no infrastructure. By the time they finished, 96 men had given their lives, officially. They left behind the largest dam on Earth, a structure that transformed America America's southwest from barren desert to metropolis, Las Vegas, Phoenix, Los Angeles, cities that thrived in places nature never intended, powered by a river, finally brought to heel. Before Hoover Dam, the Colorado River was a law unto itself. In 1905, it demonstrated its power when irrigation canals in California's Imperial Valley breached. For 16 relentless months, the river poured unchecked into a desert basin, drowning thousands of acres of farmland and creating an accidental lake, the Salton Sea. It took two years and $10 million to force the river back to its original channel. Yet, this river that destroyed with flood would cruelly vanish when needed most. Spring snowmelt sent torrents downstream that farmers couldn't contain, but by midsummer, the Colorado often shrank to a trickle, leaving fields to wither under the merciless desert sun. Herbert Hoover, an engineer before he was a politician, believed this unpredictable river could be harnessed. As Secretary of Commerce, he locked representatives from all seven competing states in a room and refused to let them leave until they reached an agreement. The 1922 Colorado River Compact split the river between upper and lower basin states, clearing the way for what would become the Boulder Canyon Project. Then came Black Tuesday, October 29, 1929. As the Great Depression descended on America, the ambitious dam project took on a new significance. More than flood control or electricity, it now promised something America desperately needed. Jobs. To build the world's largest dam, workers would first need to do something unprecedented, divert an entire river around a construction site. In 1931, crews began drilling four massive tunnels through the solid rock walls of Black Canyon, each 56 feet in diameter and nearly 4,000 feet long. Men known as sand hogs toiled inside these half-mile tunnels, drilling into rock faces that reached 140 degrees Fahrenheit. The air was thick with silica dust and carbon monoxide, silently damaging lungs with each breath. Overseeing it all was Frank Hurry Up Crow, a veteran dam builder with a personal motto, never my belly to a desk. Crow prowled the sights at all hours, spotted at 2am with a flashlight in hand, one worker recalled, he didn't want to listen to what was going on down there, he wanted to see it with his own eyes. Crow's inventive mind fashioned solutions to impossible problems. He designed a drilling jumbo, a truck-mounted platform carrying 30 pneumonic drills that could bore blast holes simultaneously. With this contraption, crews blasted the tunnels at record speed. By November 1932, the impossible had been achieved. The entire Colorado River now flowed through man-made passages, leaving the riverbed dry for the first time in a millennia. With the site prepared, attention turned to the dam itself. Requiring more concrete than had ever been used in a single structure, engineers knew pouring the dam as one solid mass would be catastrophic. The heat of curing would be so intense that it would have taken 125 years for the concrete to cool to ambient temperatures. Instead, they designed a grid of interlocking columns, each poured in five-foot segments. An elaborate network of cooling pipes, nearly 590 miles in total, was embedded throughout. Chilled water circulated through these pipes, drawing out heat as the concrete cured. Above the canyon, nine highline cableways transported enormous buckets of concrete, 
each weighing 18 tons from mixing plants to precise positions on the rising dam. Most remarkable were the high scalers, men who dangled from ropes hundreds of feet above the canyon floor, armed with jackhammers and dynamite. They scaled the canyon walls to remove loose rock. These daredevils became legends, sometimes performing acrobatic stunts for visitors. One famous scaler, Louis One Rope Fagan, would swing from one work area to another, carrying co-workers like a human trapeze. It was on this project that hard hats were first widely used in American construction, born of necessity as falling rocks claimed too many lives. Behind every ton of concrete are the stories of 21,000 men who built the dam. They came from all 48 states, driven by one precious commodity, a paying job. For early workers, home was a miserable shantytown known as Ragtown. One worker's daughter recalled, there was just nothing, nothing green around here. Everything was baked, hot, and brown. Temperatures routinely reached 120 degrees in summer. Water was scarce. Dust storms coated everything in fine silt. Yet men endured these hellish conditions because 50 cents an hour was a fortune when millions of Americans couldn't find work at any wage. By 1932, conditions improved with the establishment of Boulder City, a planned community built from scratch by the government. The mess hall served 6,000 meals daily. All you could eat for $1.50 a day, a luxury for men accustomed to soup kitchen lines. Federal Administrator Sim Zile ran the town with an iron hand, banning gambling, prostitution, and alcohol. Residents remembered him as a hard man. He had his own ideas and he put them into practice, and you had to go by his rules. In one extraordinary incident, a Bureau of Reclamation engineer fell from the canyon rim. As he plummeted towards certain death, high scaler Oliver Cowan snatched him from midair, grabbing the man's leg as he fell past. This heroic act was so celebrated that Las Vegas nominated Cowan for the Carnegie Heroes Medal. In August 1931, tensions boiled over. A summer heat peaked and wages were cut. About 1,500 workers walked off the job, demanding better pay and safer conditions. Frank Crow showed little sympathy, calling the strikers malcontents. He would be glad to be rid of. Six companies delivered an ultimatum, return to work or be fired and evicted. With jobs nearly impossible to find elsewhere, the men reluctantly returned after eight days. The project's official death toll is 96 men, struck by falling boulders, killed in blast and accidents, drowned in the river, crushed under truck rollers. The true toll was likely higher, including those who perished from heat exhaustion and carbon monoxide poisoning. The very first fatality was J.G. Tierney, a surveyor who drowned while scouting the dam site in 1922. The last was his son, Patrick Tierney, who fell to his death in 1935. Father and son died on December 20th, exactly 13 years apart, bookending the human sacrifice that built the dam. By 1936, what had once been a wild gorge was transformed. Behind the massive concrete curve, the Colorado's restrained waters rose steadily, creating Lake Mead, at the time the largest official reservoir in the world. On September 30th, 1935, Franklin D. Roosevelt arrived to dedicate the nearly completed structure. Standing before a crowd of 10,000, Roosevelt gazed up at the towering wall and declared, this morning I came, I saw, and I was conquered. In the pointed political maneuver, Roosevelt referred to the structure as Boulder Dam, never once mentioning Herbert Hoover, who had done more than anyone to make the project possible. The dam would remain officially known as Boulder Dam until 1947, when Harry Truman restored the name Hoover Dam. By 1937, giant turbines began spinning in the powerhouse, driven by water falling through the enormous pipes with the force of a small Niagara. The dam's generators produced electricity that dwarfed any other power plant of its era. This cheap, abundant electricity flowed outwards on high-tension lines, transforming the Southwest. Places that had never known electric lights now blazed with power. The metropolitan dreams of Los Angeles, Phoenix, and Las Vegas suddenly seemed possible. Equally important was the water itself. Lake Mead became a gigantic reservoir holding enough water to cover Connecticut 10 feet deep. Los Angeles and other cities built aqueducts to tap the Colorado, allowing formerly arid regions to support explosive growth. 
downstream, controlled flow allowed irrigation of more than 1.5 million acres of farmland. Formerly parched valleys blossomed with crops. For workers' memorial inscription, they died to make the desert bloom, had become literal truth. During World War I, Hoover Dam's electricity powered crucial defense industries, aluminium plants, aircraft factories, and the massive basic magnesium plant that supplied a quarter of all magnesium used in American warplanes. The dam built to tame a river was now helping to power the arsenal of democracy. The dam was more than a utility, it was a monument. Los Angeles architect Gordon B. Kaufman refined its appearance with elegant Art Deco styling. The intake towers rose with fluted silhouettes, geometric patterns adorned ventilation grills and elevator doors. The result was a structure that conveyed both power and grace. Sculptor Oscar J. W. Hansen created the dam's most striking artistic elements, two bronze winged figures of the Republic, each 30 feet tall. At their feet, Hansen installed an extraordinary terrazzo star map showing the exact position of the stars on the day of the dam's dedication. Perhaps nowhere was the dam's transformative power more evident than in Las Vegas. Once a sleepy railroad stop with barely 5,000 residents, Vegas reinvented itself with Hoover Dam's cheap electricity and water. By the 1940s, casinos were lighting up the desert night, creating the foundation of the entertainment capital we know today. Nearly a century later, Hoover Dam stands as both triumph and paradox. This 726-foot concrete colossus represents one of humanity's grandest attempts to reshape nature, a testament to engineering prowess during America's darkest economic hour. The dam still generates electricity for half a million homes, but beyond statistics lies a deeper story of a nation that refused to surrender to economic collapse and of ordinary men who accomplished the extraordinary. Today, Hoover Dam faces challenges its builders couldn't have foreseen. Lake Mead has shrunk dramatically, revealing bathtub rings on the canyon walls. The Colorado River Compact allocated more water on paper than the river typically provides. As climate patterns shift and populations grow, 40 million Americans who depend on the Colorado face difficult questions about water usage. Still, as a human achievement, Hoover Dam remains unsurpassed. Its elegant styling elevated what could have been merely functional into something beautiful. As one observer noted in 1936, what nature sculptured in the Grand Canyon, man has matched in Black Canyon. Perhaps the dam's most powerful legacy is its human one. In our age of computerized construction, it's worth remembering that Hoover Dam was built primarily by hand, by men with jackhammers and shovels, by high scalers dangling on ropes, and puddlers tamping concrete with their boots. These were not mythical heroes, but ordinary Americans who found themselves part of something extraordinary. Their sacrifices are commemorated in the bronze plaque that bears their names and the simple inscription, they died to make the desert bloom. Hoover Dam remains what Hansen called it, a monument to collective genius exerting itself in community efforts around a common need or ideal. It represents both the possibilities and limits of human ambition, a structure that tamed a wild river, transformed a region, and continues to stand as a testament to what can be achieved when necessity, vision, and raw human determination converge. Hey guys, thanks for watching. If you liked the video and would like to support the channel, please like and subscribe. That stuff really helps the channel out. And if you have a friend that you think would also like this video, please feel free to send it their way. If you have any video topics you'd like us to cover in the future, feel free to drop them in the comments below. Thanks again for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.